it and we would just record until they kicked us out <laughs> in guitar center in an active guitar center during working hours and never bought any anything how are you doing with the with the talking about the the thing you know in the past you know we would stick to uh oh, something's wrong with our video connection. Can we do this over phone? Or like, you know, something <laughs> like that. My, my, you know, it, basically, if you ever watch catfishing, <laughs> or catfish rather, uh, that we, we've been using the same techniques to get out of like people seeing us, then we would just identify, self-identify as Dan Green and kind of call it a day, you know? But for the first time ever, we're just kind of pulling it back a bit because it was starting to become the the functionality of that anonymity was just to kind of like keep it so that it was uh this big open-ended product uh project you know this big collaborative yeah sort of free-for-all and also so that you know we started this when we were very very young and you're just trying to keep ego out of it you know what i mean so like you, you, who is the armed? The armed is the armed. That's the end of the conversation. You don't always anticipate, okay, 14 years from now when the New York Times is asking you about something, what you know what I mean? <laughs> What's the fallout going to be for that? You don't really think that far ahead. But what, what had happened over the last few years, especially with Ultra Pop, was that like the this thing that was created so that no one would focus on our individual identities – made everyone solely focus on our individual identity. Oh, that's so you know interesting. Yeah, so so the you, you, the the um what I'm referring to as deception was sort of like protection of the art. Like, hey, we yeah. want to make this art. We don't want people to focus on who's making it and the egos and the story of who's making it. But then because of that, the story because we didn't have access to that, the story did become who's making it. Who exactly. are these people and who are their lives? Because early on, you know, we've always done a thing where it's like, you know, the person who's saying on the record might not be the person who sang at the show because it was just this very open ended kind of collaborative thing. You know, it, it takes a village sort of thing. You know, whoever is yeah. the best to do whatever we wanted is, is who we got to do it. And we didn't want people to have those convert. We were trying to, like, basically make our own rules of engagement for the art, which is like, you know, you see people now talking about like, uh, Josh Fries playing with the Foo Fighters and he plays ever long too fast. And it's just a lot of kind of stupid commentary in my opinion, you know yeah, what I mean? Of yeah. people who, who are, you know, hobbyists at best making the comments on the, on these things. And our, our, our whole thing with the armed was like, let's just get rid of that. The armed is the armed and that's it. We're not going to wear masks. We're not going to do whatever, but um, we'll just not really ever list people. And that'll be that. And then over time, it just became so confusing. And I think people got very imaginative and very creative with what they thought it could possibly be. Yeah. That then every article about us was mostly focusing on like how to solve that, you know, and, 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 and so there was more scrutiny on individuality because of this thing that we made to yeah. eliminate individuality from from the equation. It, it also became a thing where, frankly, you know, I've been saying this a lot, like a superpower of age is you stop giving a shit about certain things. And uh, what has been cool is that things that we would have considered corny in the past are now, I, I don't care. I don't care what anyone thinks uh, about anything we do. I just want to be as sincere as possible about it. And when you're telling people that you're trying to be as sincere as possible and you're like, by the way, my, my name is Adam Vallely. And you know what I mean? You're burying it in all these untruths. You kind of become an unreliable narrator. So the, the the thing with Perfect Saviors is that like the network of what the band is is bigger than ever. So we've reversed we we reversed engineered anonymity by just making it so fucking hard to understand anyways <laughs> that it has become anonymous again because like you said in the intro, you know, there's I, I couldn't even tell you every single person on every song and I was there when they were all recorded. You know what I mean? There's yeah. just a lot of people participating. So our thing was like we're still always going to say the armed is the armed, yeah. but then here's the performers on this one and, you know, dig yeah. into that as you will. Well, when you started, was the goal just like all of us just getting together and making music and trying to play shows? Like, was that the goal off, off the top? That's not just the goal then. It's the goal now. You know what I mean? When, but believe it or not, when you start an anonymous art hardcore collective with, you know, dozens of collaborators, it's not the easiest thing to get rich off of. <laughs> <laughs> so... 
what's cool about that and like i said getting a little older is you just stop giving a shit about really anything uh, the, the the reason we're doing this is because we want to we're trying to make the best possible thing always you know what i mean but, but how and do we want that sincerity to come through so oh sorry go sorry, ahead I, I think what i'm curious about is like just how it started in the first place it started because my cousin Kenny and I were playing music together as kids and liked playing and that's it. You know what yeah. I mean? And then we would, and then I was playing another punk band. So I talked to the guys in that band, my old band Slicer Dicer, who basically made up like the majority of the original lineup of the arm if they wanted to play music and that was it. And we would, we didn't have any money. So we would go to, uh, you know, we couldn't record properly. So this was in like 2008, 2009. So home recording has changed drastically in, in a decade and a half. And, uh, we contacted Kurt Ballou, who was my favorite, you know, producer at the time. He's the guitarist in Converge. He has a legendary studio called God City Studio. And I basically just punished the hell out of him with, a, you know, I think he could see that I was incredibly driven, you know, and that we wanted to figure out how to do this. We can't come to the studio and record for a couple of weeks. We can't afford that. So we came up with this plan to record remotely, which again, at the time was pretty crazy. He was going to like reamp a lot of the guitars in his studio, make them sound better. We didn't have any money for gear. So we would um, bring my laptop and a, a recording interface uh, to Guitar Center. <laughs> and so for, sorry, for Canadians, would... Guitar Center is like Long and McQuaid. It's like a guitar shop slash gear shop slash you can buy a bass and like picks and maybe even like an old violin there. Or like a, a right. Or something like but, that. but it's like, it, it's, it's the corporate, it's the Walmart one. So the employees there don't care enough to really stop you from doing <laughs> stupid things. So we would come in with a interface and be like, yeah, I really want to try that. Like, we would want to do like a whammy solo and we don't have a guitar with a Floyd Rose. So we would go get like a $3,000 Zach Wilde Les Paul and we would go in that little glass room, you know, the soundproof room, and we would just quickly set up all our shit and we would just record until they kicked us out <laughs> in Guitar Center, in an active Guitar Center during working hours and never bought any anything. And um, the, th the funny thing is, is like, we are literally still the same band, <laughs> like, it, it, except that now it's like, okay, there are some resource, resources available, but when we're out of money, you know, uh, Justin Meldal Johnson, who played bass on this, like, hitting him up, we don't have any more money to finish, but we have a bunch of shit to record, so can we come to your house and record there? It's like, we're still doing the same thing, it's just at a much higher level now, you know what I mean? But it's still just like trying to stretch everything to its absolute limits and make something that is you know as as unbelievable as it can be for for a band so niche and, and so of our size you know what i mean just something that feels like the scope is is kind of big and cool and weird and confusing i want to talk like musically just for a second so i just want to give people if they haven't heard you before an idea of the uh, last record of ultra pop just take a listen to this Okay, so, I mean, we're gonna do some extremes here, but this is a track off the new record. Take a listen to this. It is, again, sort of the extreme version of that. Uh, so that's off of Perfect Saviors, that's Liar 2 from The Armed. Uh, Tony Wolski's my guest from The Armed. But we're only talking like two years in between the release of those two songs. Can you walk us through the journey from what the, I guess the song we heard first to the song we heard second? We've been trying to uh, basically make a commentary on uh, the concept of, like we were talking about, niche and, and subgenre is uh, in, in our, by our estimation, sort of like outmoded by how people consume and get their art nowadays. Um, you know, a, a while ago, things, subgenres existed because things existed in a regional context, you know, or, and, and they were, they were very, very isolated pockets of crazy specific things happening. And now you can basically call on 99.9% .9 of recorded uh, art, you know what I mean, from a device that most of us have at all times to see it. So in that regard, 
the the um, religiosity of of subscribing to a subgenre rings of inauthenticity. You know what I mean? To me, it, it, it's it's not because you grew up in it and it's this tradition. It's like all of us can be exposed to all of these things at all times. Why is it not fair game? You know I, what I mean? I think mean? I understand what you're saying. So that like, say if you were like, say if you were into rock, but you yeah. grew up making music around Athens, Georgia in like the late 80s, regionally, that's what the R- REM was happening there. And so yes. regionally, bands would be interacting with one another and organically would create a subgenre, which we now know as like the Athens college rock sound. It happened, yep. it happened organically. Now, if you are assigning yourself to a subgenre with the, with the uh, availability of music uh, at your fingertips like we've never seen before, it's not entirely authentic because you don't need to do it. You can make whatever music you want. And likely are to an extent you're not, you know, you're, you're, you're listening to these other things and then you're you're basically saying that these things are verboten, you know what I mean? For for some reason, because it doesn't gel. And um, now don't get me wrong. There's an aesthetic, you know, reason to why you could make those yeah. arguments. But our whole thing is trying to I think heavy music in general, which is, you know, my fa- I like music that uh, there's a physicality there's a you know idea that it's semi dangerous or something like yeah, that that yeah. you're breaking the rules so i like that stuff but it's funny when you're you know the thing that you got into that's breaking the rules is the most religiously fervent you know like 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 strict about no 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 you do this or this or this that doesn't gel with what uh the most important part of punk culture to me which is just the the attitude you know what i mean so our thing has just been trying to, particularly in heavy music, find ways to integrate. And, you know, again, the the example is probably the most shocking of those two clips. But it's like, I think we've tried to do a way where it makes sense. You know what I mean? What we're trying to integrate and open people up to and saying maybe these things aren't um, off limits. At some level, I think that's what everyone's doing. I mean, the, the Queens guys, you know, the Queens of the Stone Age, we just went on tour with them and that that's always been long their thing it's like isn't that the bare minimum of what it takes to be a band shouldn't the the bare minimum of being a band being like you're providing something new for people and i think there's something interesting in hardcore and in heavy music where a lot of times it's not it's trying to make the perfect venn diagram center of all the coolest things you know what i mean but that fits perfectly for everyone who likes that thing um, we're not. We're trying to 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 poke and prod and make you a little uncomfortable. How was it for you? How was it for you creatively? Like, how did you find singing? How did you find writing melodies? How did you find writing sort of pop music? Yeah, well, I mean, a lot of us are um, kind of music n- nerds. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like uh, we come from, you know, like. I, I was always in jazz band and marching band and pit orchestra and orchestra. And so it's like a lot of this stuff was just stuff that was in our vocabulary the whole time. And like I said, it's almost like you had a uh, a regulator on the engine, you know what I mean, prior to this. And a lot of this has been fun to remove some of those things and see what we can do. And uh, we're never just doing it to do it. You know what I mean? It's always trying to find an organic way in, but it's been fun fun and unique. And, and, you know, I think we're just trying to, as we get older, you just care about posturing less. And we don't, we already got real fit for the last one. We don't really care about f- seeming tough anymore. You know what I mean? So it's like, <laughs> what what is going to make the music is b- the best thing possible. And it's like, you know, uh, uh, I, again, I love hardcore and I love really extreme noise and stuff that we grew up in, but I also, you know, uh, love, uh, you know, uh, St. Vincent and yeah. the red hot chili peppers. <laughs> like, I, I just, I just like music. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about legibility. I think when you first get into hardcore, 
um, I remember like I remember first getting into that music when I was in like high school, you know, and like yeah, because course. because I liked country music and and folk music, but there wasn't really a scene for that in my hometown. So if you were outside what the norm was, you had to hang out with the punk and hardcore kids, and they were like really welcoming and exciting, even though you know I, yeah, I you know. So I like learned about Minor Threat and I learned about all these bands, but I even remember having this moment of like I don't understand anything they're saying, you know, I don't I don't, yeah. I, don't I can't make it out. When you um, and of course as you grow older, you can make it out a little bit more and things change. But as a, as a singer and as a vocalist and as someone who's communicating lyrics, does something change for you when you make pop music in terms of um, if when you're singing about really sort of really big ideas on, on this record in some cases, the idea that people can understand them or like you, you are more legible in your singing of them? I think it was kind of a little bit of re-education for this. We always knew that if we wanted to make this trilogy of albums that resulted in like us reverse engineering pop music for our you know uh, uh nefarious reasons we would want it to end with like an album that was also more immediately digestible and mixed more traditionally so to me this album you know definitely clarity for the first time ever was an important aspect of it and um which is still interesting because some of the negative comments I see are just like the vocals are too quiet from people, which is funny. <laughs> it's like, well, you should you should hear all the other stuff that we ever recorded. <laughs> if you hate this, then you'd really hate our last it, ten records. Is there but, any yeah. is there any additional like vulnerability with that? Like, um, well, now these lyric people are going to hear these lyrics more than they have before. Absolutely, and I think you know something else that we've done from the conceptual level with the lyrics is like. We wanted this record in in uh, sonically to be more digestible in an immediate fashion. I still think that there's so much hiding in here that it rewards multiple, multiple listens. But for the very first time, I don't think we've ever done this. We wanted to make a record that you could just listen to right away and sort of appreciate. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Because, you know, the hipster, the the hardcore hipster kid in you is like, well, that that's dumb. That's cheesy. But it was like, no, like, let's get cheesy. Let's be vulnerable with it. You know what I mean? So there are a lot of lyrics that are saying very simple things and saying very, you know, direct forward things with the, in the first person voice. And that was definitely key to us was like, no, what's going to hit people immediately? You how, know how what did I that mean? Feel? How did that feel for you? Uh, it's, it's sort of scary. And again, I'm 37. I don't care. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, well, no, no one can hurt me anymore. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that. That's kind of the thing. So it's like it, it was scary, but I feel like we finally just aged into, uh, you know, uh, not caring enough about what anyone could have the reaction to finally being brave enough to do it. Um, well, let's in in that. Let's go, let's hear some music before we go, and maybe we can just talk a little bit about the song. Just take a listen to this. I mean, really encapsulating everything that we're talking about there, like uh, uh, melodically, singability, um, sincerity. Uh, yeah. Uh, does anybody, does anyone even know you? Does anyone even care? Um, collaborations from people. I mean, I think that's Julian Baker is on that, uh, who's yeah, an incredible gorgeous solo voice. artist and, and Invoy Genius as well. Um, that's the song, uh, Sportiform. Talk to me a little bit about that song. Yeah, uh, so that was the first single we put out. Uh, it has a cool video with Iggy Pop in it, which is like a whole other separate story. That's and a, Detroit. a Detroit. I mean, like you're from Detroit yeah. and you got Iggy Pop on that record? Yeah, I mean, it's the coolest thing that we've ever done. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. It's yeah. like, because yeah. because Iggy Pop isn't just like, he's obviously like this legend, this icon, this like ultimate sort of celebrity, the godfather of punk. And then when you're also from Detroit, you also have that... <laughs> What's funny is that like y your parents are also like, oh, my God, that's so cool. You know what I mean? Because, yeah. you know, like your parents and your aunts and uncles have seen him at the Grandy Ballroom. So there's this sort of like generational um, veneration of Iggy Pop that you grew up on. So getting him was absolutely the neatest thing to be in in that video. Um, but, yeah, that song, we wanted to sort of encapsulate a good cross section of of the record and the uh, diverse, you know, sounds and approaches to everything. And that that ending is it's a perfect example after our conversation about lyrical content, where it was just boiling it down to something that, you know, maybe a younger, hipper me would have been like, that's, you know, corny. No, we're going to bury it under several layers of protection. But, you know, the, the, the idea there is just 
everything we're talking about in the 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 culture is kind of this thing that everyone now has this life of a broadcaster thrust upon them you know you're 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 Tom Power and you have a show but everyone has a show now you know what i mean like everyone has a show and it's on their phone they might have three or four shows because they have multiple social media things and you always feel you know the pressure to broadcast and this this idea of um popularity that we all grew up with in school has has warped into this like kind of greater cultural thing that you feel the need to have almost like a celebrity influence on the culture around you which i think is you know kind of crazy and Im imposing it's an imposing expectation to put on everybody and that's just you know that's the end of the song is does it does anyone even know you does anyone even care is sort of like the end question to to everything for so many people and that's uh a bummer <laughs> it is yeah you know? it, it, it man i gotta tell you like um i i i i, I really like the record um i really i really love the way you think about music and you, and you think about culture and I, and I love hearing it from you but just if i can end sort of personally you know at the beginning of the conversation you said something like you know hey when you start a band and you have this like idea with your cousin that you're going to have an anonymous collective make this music. You don't expect it in 14 years, the New York Times is going to be knocking on your door and asking you questions. 100%. But on, yeah, on, a, yeah. on a personal level, it is quite remarkable to go from, you know, experimenting in, in the basement. And a lot of our friends who started hardcore bands in their basement, well, that was it. To go to this place where, you know, you're, you're um, not just on tour with Queens of the Stone Age, but you're getting written about in all these big yeah. uh, magazines. Talking to you right now. Oh, yeah. I mean, I know, I know they, they call this the apex, you know, you know, in Canada, <laughs> in, in Canada, they call this get Nicky Popper your record, but um, <laughs> don't, don't, I don't appreciate the laughter, but what do you, uh, what do you, what, what, what do you make of this, this journey that you've been on? We're just trying to enjoy it. again things happening later in life. It, you just have perspective on it. It's all very silly. You know what I mean? It's all very silly and very cool. If this would have happened right away, we'd probably be insufferable. But the fact that it's happening now, it's just it's just cool and we appreciate it. You know what I mean? It's it's incredibly flattering. Anyone gives a shit. So it, fun, awesome, cool. You know what I mean? Let's do it. <laughs> we're we're going to keep trying to do the same thing. You know what I mean? And, 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 and hopefully people care. And uh, that's, that's really neat to us. So it's been a fun ride. Look at all this sincerity. I love it. I love this. It's, it's, it's so exciting. It's like we're a bright eyes record here. Uh, oh. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing this. And thanks for making the time. I'd love it to meet you. Uh, likewise. Thank you so much. Uh,